Well, hello and welcome to the Goodfellow uh, webinar for tonight with Dr. Grant, Su Grant Suchfield. Excuse me, tripping over my words. It's a tongue twister, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> uh, we're going to be talking about that ringing in your ears. So without any further ado, I'll hand you over to, uh, to Grant. So over to you. Cheers. Uh, <laughs> thanks very much, everybody, for, for joining us to, tonight. So as was mentioned, I'm happy to answer as many questions as we can tonight, but if there are further questions or in clinical practice you come up against some cases that you would like to discuss with someone, you're very welcome to email me at uh, Auckland University. So what I want to do tonight is really to introduce the topic of tinnitus, talk a little bit about tinnitus mechanisms before looking at its management. Uh, my background is as an audiologist and so some of what I present is going to be slightly biased in that perspective but what I really want to do is, is look at the role of uh, primary health here in this particular space and look at some guidelines and really some issues that people may experience. Then I'm going to talk about three cases that uh, are quite different but each with a different sort of challenge to primary care and also um, audiology and other healthcare professionals. So first starting really out is tinnitus is not a new phenomenon. Uh, in early medical texts there is writing about various things that we interpret as, as being about tinnitus. So this example, if when the hand of a ghost seizes a man, his, his ears sing. These types of uh, medical sayings and text tend to suggest that tinnitus was something that was considered from an early perspective. Often it does have a religious uh, connotation, as medic many medical uh, phenomena did do. As we've uh, advanced in time, we, we get to know a little bit more about tinnitus and we know a reasonable about, about tinnitus in New Zealand. We conducted a, a survey several years ago with quite a large snapshot of, of the population. The results that we have do not differ greatly from those undertaken overseas, uh, but there are some interesting uh, different aspects in the New Zealand population when we look at prevalence among Maori and other uh, groups, Polynesian and Asian uh, groups within New Zealand. Because what we find is its prevalence is higher in the uh, New Zealand European population at around about 7% across age groups shown at the top of this chart while amongst Māori and other groups in New Zealand is a, a lot lower. Uh, it's higher in males than in females. This is presumably because of higher occupational noise exposure, at least uh, traditionally in the case of males working in industry and farming and also uh, military it's interesting in the United States, the number one service related injury is tinnitus and uh, Veterans Affairs in the United States spends uh, around $30 million annually on rehabilitation for veterans. Interesting. Second is hearing loss. So these auditory related phenomena are there um, and I'll possibly touch on, on why it's quite so significant uh, later on. There is an age-related characteristic to tinnitus is as we get older its prevalence increases. Now it's difficult to extract that from hearing loss. I because that, yeah. that parallel with yeah. hearing loss. So, so yeah. as we get older uh, we're more likely to experience hearing yeah. loss and so uh, the, the coincidence, the comorbidity of tinnitus and hearing loss is, is quite high. Mm -hmm. So if we look at over 65, then it's around about 14% of the population. Mm -hmm. It seems to affect individuals fairly similarly, no, no matter their uh, income 
And if we look at distribution around the regions in New Zealand, it's fairly evenly distributed. Lower in Auckland, again, that's probably because of the Maori and Polynesian and also right. Asian uh, populations. Now, we don't know why it's lower. Um, it could be cultural, it could be beliefs, mm -hmm. and I'll allude again to, to how beliefs can actually uh, change the prevalence of tinnitus. And it may in fact just be due to other morbidity. We obviously know that uh, Maori are less likely to uh, live beyond age 65, and unfortunately mm -hmm. that may show up in, in these statistics. So that reflects the lower percentage in Auckland, not quite sure why it's high, so high in Wellington. Um, my colleagues have wondered whether that's something to do with the politicians, but uh, we really, we really can't <laughs> no assume way of too much more. That, yeah. We can't demonstrate that. <laughs> so, in order to understand tinnitus, we really have to understand how the hearing system functions, and essentially, anywhere in the pathway from sound entering the ear canal through to it actually resulting activity in the auditory cortex can result in tinnitus. A simple obstruction of the ear canal with wax or a foreign body of some form uh, or injury to the middle ear, middle ear effusion, glue ear, can result in tinnitus. Typically, when these particular pathologies clear, the tinnitus goes as well. And so it tends to be a temporary tinnitus. Uh, and a blockage of the ear canal or middle ear problem may not actually be arising in new activity within the auditory system. It may in fact be the person is able to hear existing activity that previously just not has not been registered or has been covered by background environmental sound. Uh, there was a famous tinnitus study done in the 1950s in New York where a group of university students without tinnitus, without hearing loss, were placed in a soundproof room. They were given a piece of paper and a and pen and, and told, if you're going to be in here for a while, we just want you to write down the sounds that you hear in this room. And what they heard was crickets buzzing, hissing, whizzing, whistling sounds, oh sounds typically that we'd associate with tinnitus, and they heard those uh, in that room. They exited the room. If they focused quite strongly, they might hear them, but for most people, it went away. And so in that case, it's really that those individuals and people who have a blocked ear canal are simply preventing everyday sounds from obscuring the code for silence. So when we move beyond that and we get changes in the inner ear, the auditory nerve, brainstem up to the auditory cortex, then we really get, if you like, a, a pathological tinnitus. Now, sometimes the easiest definition of tinnitus is objective and uh, subjective. Objective tinnitus, other people can hear. Now, this is rare, uh, certainly, if you hold a stethoscope near the ear or on the neck, sometimes you can hear the individual's complaint. Typically, they'll complain of a pulsing sound mm -hmm. or, or a clicking sound. The clicking sound is often eustachian tube dysfunction or the soft palate bumping up, up and down. Right. Uh, the pulsatile sound is often blood flow. And mm -hmm. typically, the question then to ask, is that pulse, in fact, in time with the heartbeat? And if it is, then uh, this is something to become a little bit concerned about. Mm -hmm. The majority of cases, it is not something particularly sinister, but certainly it is often created by turbulence through blood vessels. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, obviously, there are a number of blood vessels that pass close to the ear. Some of those uh, microvasculature and uh, that's enough uh, the pulse to be actually heard there. It's not anything sinister. And in fact, there's nothing really to be done about that. Uh, in other cases, there can be some obstruction of the blood vessels. And so in such cases, 
uh, further investigation is warranted mm -hmm. to make sure that there isn't going to be uh, the risk of a vascular event. It has to be said, again, this is relatively rare. The majority of cases of tinnitus that we talk about and are really considered true tinnitus are those we call subjective tinnitus, mm -hmm. where only the individual themselves can, can hear it. And that's typically begins with some form of injury to the ear, though as I'll talk a little bit about, it can be associated with other more central mechanisms such as stress or even uh, neck injury that essentially unlocks auditory activity. So when we hear sound, we obviously have movement of the middle ear, the, the three smallest bones in the human body, the, the middle ear ossicles, they cause fluid movement within the inner ear and movement of the hair cells, which then transfer their movement into electrical activity that happens along the auditory nerve. What we know is if we record activity from the auditory nerve, in most cases of tinnitus, we will not see an increase in activity, which we would see when we hear a normal sound. In fact, the auditory nerve is quieter and it's only at the brainstem nuclei shown here in the slightly pink areas as we're moving up uh, four, five and six on this diagram that there's an increase in activity. And while it was once thought that the inner ear was the source of tinnitus, in fact, it's now really presumed that it's actually the processing higher up in the brain trying to make sense of the lack of activity in the auditory nerve that is responsible for that. And one of the interesting uh, reasons why we know that is because if we cut the auditory nerve in an attempt to separate the source of the mm -hmm. sound from perception, uh, the majority of people will not show an improvement of tinnitus. Right. Mm -hmm. Some people will have an increase in tinnitus. Mm -hmm. Other people, the tinnitus won't change, but they've lost all their hearing. Mm -hmm. And for other people, a very small percentage, yes, it provides some benefit. Now, there may be a timing um, aspect to this with establishment of a signal within the auditory pathways, but uh, cutting the auditory nerve is no longer considered a, an ethical operation for tinnitus because it largely cuts off one of the major treatment options for tinnitus, which is the use of sound. As uh, research has progressed, our understanding again has moved from the inner ear being the source to perhaps these auditory nuclei generating the sound. Studies in animals, and yes, it's possible to find out whether an animal has tinnitus or not, it's a, it's a quite challenging. Yeah, it's a, it's a yeah. challenging question. You certainly can't ask it. No. You know, um, but there are behavioural studies that can be done that, that provide this information. Now, if you record from uh, fibres from the uh, cochlear nucleus, which is the first processing station of the auditory brain, in an animal that does not have tinnitus, you see a recording from an individual nerve fibre that looks a little bit like this. Uh, you see a, a, a wavy line and every so often there's a little bit of a, a flick up. That's an action potential. The right. brain codes this as silence. Clearly right. there's not silence within the auditory nerve. There's activity there, but the brain says, okay, silence, yeah, learns silence. that. Right. In an animal with tinnitus, we see a different picture. And unlike the auditory nerve, which we see as quiet, when we go to the uh, cochlear nucleus, suddenly there's an increase in activity. Mm. So this increase here is similar to what we would see in the response to sound. And as we travel up through the various nuclei, there seems to be an amplification of activity, as if the brain is trying to make up for a reduction in auditory activity, mm. and so it's perceived as sound. Uh, what I liken this to in patients is if you move out of the city listening to a radio station, the further you go away from the radio station, the more difficult it becomes to hear that. So you tend to really turn the volume up. 
but as you turn the volume up the background noise increases mm. as well and so your ability to simply hear what you want uh is defeated mm. and you hear instead the noise that's a good analogy I like. so that. so yeah. you hear the setup yeah. now what we also know is that yes the auditory cortex the processing part of the brain is more active in individuals with tinnitus it's very difficult however to tell the difference between one individual that has tinnitus and a person that doesn't have tinnitus so we can't by using imaging or electrophysiology tell the difference between individuals if we have a group with tinnitus and a group without there are differences there right so useful from a, a research perspective not terribly useful from a diagnostic perspective yeah. where we have a particular group that can help us out are some rare individuals who can actually turn their tinnitus completely on and off oh. this is rare um, two general groups one who can um, focus on an object with their vision and avert their gaze just simply by moving their eyes and for a split speak, second or so the tinnitus goes off That's so they can turn okay. it off with they visual another group can actually change it with oral facial movements so extending their jaw or even pushing on the, on the top of their oh, head wow. again very rare and certainly it's not something that they can sustain as a treatment right. but when we're doing imaging of course what we're often after is a before and after image mm. and so with these individuals we are able to see tinnitus no tinnitus compare mm. them and this is the sort of image that we can capture uh, and this particular work was hailed at the time I uh, received a lot of press origin of tinnitus found yes. okay um, mm. But we've actually moved on from even this yeah. to understanding actually when we look now at uh, imaging conducted over a number of stu studies what we find is that tinnitus is not actually just an increase in the auditory cortex we consider it more of a network problem in that individuals who have tinnitus have greater connections between the auditory cortex and other parts of the brain that we really only occasionally think about in association with hearing for example there's a strong association between the auditory cortex and regions of the brain in the hippocampus associated with memory a strong association between the auditory cortex and the somatosensory cortex now why is that there a little mm. bit unusual um, a strong association with perception uh, salience and distress now seeing this and understanding that people that have particularly bothersome tinnitus have really strong connections with these regions versus perhaps a person that hears tinnitus but actually doesn't isn't bothered by it mm. okay and uh, tinnitus can be very much considered as a, as a pyramid where a lot of people will say I have tinnitus but I'm not bothered by it so that link that distressing aspect of it really hasn't been formed and this is really an important aspect for those people seeking advice the first advice that they actually receive can keep it in that non bothersome aspect sure. or it right. can elevate it to problem tinnitus because some people experience tinnitus and it truly isn't a problem uh, other people will have it catastrophically uh, and I alluded to veterans um, it's also the case in, in New Zealand but obviously in the United States with such a large armed services and with um, experience in Afghanistan and Iraq so they have this large body of individuals now in their case you have a perfect storm of auditory um, damage mm -hmm. because of a blast you also have potentially head and neck injury because of the nature of what was causing the blast mm -hmm. you also have the mental trauma in the in that you may have seen 
you know, quite horrific injuries or death yeah. of your uh, comrades and friends. And, and so you've got activation of all this network at once, and that really is the perfect mm. storm for developing a distressing tinnitus. So we've developed a, a more of a psychosocial model of tinnitus that builds on some of the neurophysiology and incorporates things that are a little bit more difficult for us to actually encapsulate within mm. neurophysiology. Uh, and this really says that uh, we have the individual. We know that personality is a very strong predictor of tinnitus. In the Dunedin um, cohort uh, longitudinal study, yeah. uh, at age 32, there was a, question, a couple of questions about tinnitus. One of the strongest predictors about tinnitus um, was per, came down to personality. And this has been shown in the same personality traits come through. Anxious individuals, those that are most mm -hmm. likely to scan their environment or be concerned about their health, are those that are most likely to suffer right. from tinnitus. Okay. Um, also those that have a lot of um, stress, um, who perhaps have retired, have time on their hands, yeah. um, and uh, have lower cognitive load. So we find that people that are uh, often, hmm, tinnitus isn't a problem during the work day. Interesting, yeah. But when you get home at night, sit down, try and relax. That can have an, uh, an effect. Is there any evidence, just noticing a question that came in about medic the role of medications, I guess, affecting the person? Absolutely. Yeah. And within this context, and I'll, mm -hmm. I'll also talk a little bit about that, I suppose this relates to stimulants. Sure. Um, and we talk about um, diet and lifestyle. Uh, there's very little evidence for common um, stimulants such as caffeine having any effect oh, on right. tinnitus. Now, I'd have to caution against this because I, th I think the one take-home message, the most important message that anybody should take home from this talk is the individual. Right. And there is no one individual with tinnitus. Yes. Uh, it's a very heterogeneous uh, population, it, it causes huge problems for, for research. Um, and there may be individuals that respond to, to caffeine in, in unusual ways or, or have particular effects. Certainly we know that almost every medication uh, that's listed, if you look at a side effect, somewhere in there, right. tinnitus yeah. is listed. Yes. And in fact, many of the medications that have been suggested as potential tinnitus medications have tinnitus listed as a side right. effect. Okay. So I think we have to be a little bit careful there. We, we have to um, consider some of those things. Um, and, and the real message there is around if it's likely to be ototoxic, mm -hmm. if it's likely to cause a hearing loss, then uh, we, we raise it as a concern. Yeah, like but sure. individuals will, will have um, quite strong effects. If there is some timing effect there, it could be coincidental um, observation management if there are alternatives, possibly considering that. Sure. Uh, certainly in audiology practice, uh, if a person says, I believe it's a medication, then we refer back to the prescriber yeah. uh, to have a look okay. at that. But we don't place a lot of weight on it because uh, usually there is no link there. Sure. And in fact, in a population okay. study, um, people that drink more coffee are less likely to have tinnitus. Oh, okay. So popular mythology. Um, Is there any um, particular effect of steroids? Well, you, you know, know steroids um, have been suggested potentially as a tinnitus treatment right. agent. Yeah. Uh, and when it comes to medications, um, I'll refer a little bit in, in the, later on the talk to the American Academy of otolaryngology and they do not have any recommendations on medications at this particular point in time. Sure. Um, there are some things that I'm going to sort of put out there yeah. as, as potential. <laughs> um, uh, generally, if we're considering medications, typically it's in relationship to comorbidities. Sure management of anxiety, management of depression. Right. Uh, and of course, we have a little bit of a chicken and egg scenario. 
did the tinnitus cause the problems yes. that the person complained about or did those problems exacerbate the tinnitus? Uh, and it's not entirely clear and it probably differs from individual to individual. So all these environmental factors can affect the individual as well. Time of day, there seems to be a circadian rhythm to tinnitus mm. that's beginning to emerge. Um, but an interesting thing is around these psychosocial factors and values and relationships. And I think that here, the advice that we um, provide or the advice that people actually get, is it on the internet or through medical mm. practitioners is so important. There are people that um, who believe, and there, there's some cultures that where you hear a sound in your ear, it doesn't have to be mm. voices, a sound is viewed as a blessing because it's seen as a deity or God mm. communicating. So that's a positive thing. So that has a positive association. So who doesn't want to be talked so, to by God? Yeah, sure. you're right. So that's a positive thing. On the other end of the scale, there are people that have undergone um, exorcisms because it's a sign of demonic wow. possession. All right. Gosh. Now, that per the, the person may be experiencing exactly the same sound, right. but the context and beliefs associated with that have the impact. The so sure. if we are providing a positive background and are really reducing the fears associated with tinnitus, we, we say what it is, we um, give honest, straightforward advice, often that's all the person needs. Mm. If we don't blow it out of proportion, if we certainly, we don't say, well, sorry to hear that, yes. um, you're going to have to live with that. Yeah. Um, but offering, you know, really good advice, um, there are some places where people can be referred to that are safe on the internet, and I'll allude to some of those, but just, just good, honest advice, checking off any medical conditions that may actually be related to the tinnitus. Uh, but the vast majority of people reporting tinnitus have no strong, identifiable, treatable medical problem, mm -hmm. usually associated with some change in the auditory system, often too small to actually even show up in a hearing test. Right. Okay, so so these mm -hmm. things are very important. And, and actually getting on to medical treatments here, um, often I show these and, and trying to justify some of the treatments that audiologists uh, right. provide. Um, I'm sure these are, this is a formation. This is the basis, creative, but yeah. This is the basis of medicine, isn't it? You yeah, know, goodness. cockroaches ground in rose oil, earthworms bored in goose grease and inserted in the ear. Yeah. Um, the last one possibly has an element of effectiveness associated with it. Really? It's probably it's probably <laughs> not the urine of ox, uh, and I'm pretty sure the merm was really about perhaps taking away the smell Overcoming of the, the urine. Scent, sure. <laughs> but we do know that vinegar, vinegar has yeah. quite strong antimicrobial antibiotic right. effects, and um, if the tinnitus was caused by an outer ear infection, possibly that might have some benefit. Mm -hmm. But vinegar. Let's hope someone's yeah, got better but, after that. Anyway. Yeah, but, uh, yeah. <laughs> now, uh, sort of thinking on the, on the lines of treatments that yeah. uh, are out there, there are a lot of complementary medicines mm. uh, and also those treatments that are really exploiting an area because we don't know a lot about tinnitus, you know, because there is no surefire cure or sound medical treatment, there are a wide number of uh, treatments that are available claiming various things on the internet. Typically, the active ingredient within uh, these uh, supplements mm -hmm. tend to be zinc or magnesium. Uh, the evidence for these is, is relatively low. Right. Another common active ingredient is ginkgo biloba. And this has um, some vascular dilation um, benefits. Uh, but in a recent Cochrane review, I think the last was, was 2013, um, no evidence. Right. Um, but the, the, 
the background studies forming that um, are relatively low levels of evidence, and some of those suggest there were some benefits. One other thing I would say about um, any Cochrane reviews in the tinnitus area at the moment, apart from cognitive behavioural therapy, is that inevitably what the review will say is that there's a low level of evidence right. or sufficient insufficient quality of studies to undertake this. Um, and, and so I wouldn't refer to the Cochrane literature at this particular point, largely because the reviews, um, the criteria applied is eliminating the bulk of the discovery research that's currently sure. undergoing in this area. Just while we're talking about sort of slightly complementary alternative, any um, thoughts on uh, Chinese medicine, mainly acupuncture? Yeah, now that, that's interesting because, as, as I mentioned, I was going to talk a little bit about these. So uh, I mean, some of No, no, it's good because it's, a, it's a, yeah. a timely point because it actually relates to this here. The American Academy of Otolaryngology specifically uh, identified dietary supplements and acupuncture as two areas in which they looked at. Okay. Uh, dietary supplements they recommended against. Right. So they, they felt that there was sufficient evidence to recommend against it. Uh, with acupuncture, they said there was no recommendation, essentially okay. because the level of evidence is insufficient of... So that's so, a slightly different approach. So the dietary supplements, they actually felt there was there was sufficient evidence to suggest, to suggest no. not. Yeah. So different from there isn't enough to yeah. really recommend anything. Okay. Yeah. So that's interesting. Yeah. Um, and the acupuncture, they thought they it, just it couldn't could really be, be sure because now they're, the they're perhaps okay. aside from the traditional Chinese mechanisms of effect yeah. for acupuncture. Um, there's other reasons to suspect that somatosensory stimulation may have an, a benefit mm -hmm. for, for tinnitus because for some people there are quite clear trigger points in the head and neck and jaw yep. that seem to modulate tinnitus. Oh, okay. Now the reason for that, we believe in our research is actually linked to the connection we need between our auditory system and head and neck movement okay. because when we localize sound we move our neck obviously yep. now if there wasn't then there's a noise reduction system built in that takes information from nerve fibers in the neck with the auditory system and coordinates that if we didn't have that whenever we moved our head we'd hear a sound right yep. so um, when there's yep. an injury to the neck that might result in tinnitus because of a disruption of homeostasis around that. And um, mm. therapeutic massage, physiotherapy, perhaps acupuncture can act on, on these mechanisms mm. and so they can modify uh, a tinnitus. Interesting. Okay. It could be worth a trial for some patients. For some people, yeah. certainly yeah. those people that complain of jaw or head or neck problems, mm -hmm. which is around about 40% of people with tinnitus, which is quite high, quite high yeah. considering referral yeah. um, to physiotherapy or mm -hmm. other um, interventions when there is a clear link there yeah. is, is well worthwhile. And yeah. in, from the audiology perspective, again, it's something that we ask and working in the multidisciplinary environment that we do, many of the people that we see um, where we're managing from a hearing perspective will also be referring yep. these ways. Sure. So what's interesting is what is a modern approach yep. to to managing tinnitus? Now some of this certainly in primary care is is about a very clear history taking. It's about compassionate listening, understanding and then appropriate referrals. Um, so uh, this list in over the next couple of slides is not exhaustive, but I think it's useful. Um, complete clinical history. Uh, often, particularly if there's any indication of, of hearing loss, mm -hmm. the uh, referral for otologic examination, uh, if it's pulsatile tinnitus, mm -hmm. that's also uh, a good red flag. And audiometry to understand, is this related to any hearing loss? 
Uh, tinnitus pitch and loudness evaluation is something that an audiologist might do to characterise the tinnitus. Mm -hmm. It's helpful primarily for the significant others of the person experiencing tinnitus to try to understand, okay, that's what you're experiencing, what because often yeah. there'll be a, a little bit of a misunderstanding uh, about what this is really about. Are there environmental factors? Mm -hmm. Is it at work? Is it work stress? Mm -hmm. Is it when you're in quiet? Uh, there, is there something to do with uh, your mother-in-law that sets your tinnitus? Or, you know, is there stress? Is there something around there that causes that? Um, blood tests. Now, this is really related to overall health. There are no specific blood tests for tinnitus, although we're beginning to do some um, studies trying to look for biomarkers for tinnitus and including yeah, blood tests that. in there, yeah. and we're trying to get there. Yeah. Here we've got the, the jaw and blood pressure. High blood pressure, hypertension associated potentially with the pulsatile aspects yeah. of tinnitus, and obviously this is good general health. Um, with the blood tests, perhaps um, hyper, hypo, uh, thyroidism, these sorts of um, uh, markers as well. Lifestyle, smoking, alcohol, again, these are these are not particularly strong predictors of tinnitus. You know, well, there's a sort of 30-30-30 rule. 30% will be made worse if they drink or have right. smoke. 30% won't, and 30% it doesn't matter. But these are important considerations. Uh, really important understanding emotional factors and providing sympathetic understanding. And really a recognition that, yes, this is a real thing, but not blowing this out of the water is mm -hmm. something that's going to be horrid and you're going to lose your hearing or that you're going to be tormented by this for the rest of your life. Most evidence suggests tinnitus is worse in its first year. Well, irrespective, nice you know, and so you yeah. can say, okay, I know this is a problem now, um, and it, it may have been, been a problem, and it can go up with stress and these sorts of things. For most people, over the period of time, it's going to fall back into the background. You may still hear it, yeah. but it's going to come on and um, as less distressing. And if people can understand that often, uh, yeah. and for some people, it's when the label, it's given the label, yeah. that's tinnitus and it's transferred into a medical condition that it becomes a problem. Mm. Uh, I think, you know, provide, taking away the mystery is very powerful. Here, tinnitus is certainly a case where you provide knowledge, the person is empowered, that's great. Uh, probably the most effective treatment now and maybe moving into the future is this curing of deaf deafness. Now, and it's not saying that everybody that has tinnitus complains of hearing loss. But there is suspicion that almost everybody that has tinnitus will have some form of change in their auditory system. Right. And we do talk now about something that's called hidden hearing loss. Um, a number of people that we see um, complain of hearing like problems, but we do a beep test, the pure yeah. tone audiogram, and they pass. And people say, you've got normal hearing. But what we're becoming quite aware of is how poor a hearing test actually audiometry is. Oh, that's interesting. Uh, okay. And so people can have reasonably significant changes in the hearing that do not show up in the standard oh, hearing is. test. Right. All right. So it is possible okay. that you person to have tinnitus and have a normal hearing test result. Yep. Uh, it's really important. We try and bang this in with our, our students and we certainly encourage this with anybody that's looking to manage individual uh, the individual with tinnitus is very much to treat them as an individual. Mm -hmm. um, never say nothing can be done uh, but at the same time try to, to discourage them for going to look for the cure. Okay so it's silver bullet doesn't exist. Now I think there's you know about 12 recommendations there and um, what's interesting is they're actually from 1948. Oh, really? Okay, now, now okay. Uh, I recently did a, a little review paper because I was fascinated by this otolaryngologist, uh, Edmund Prince Fowler, who through the 1930s, um, early uh, through to the 50s, was really prolific. He was probably one of the few people actually researching tinnitus. Right. And 
in my perception of what an otolaryngologist might have been like in the 1930s, he was very holistic. And I think you could see by the recommendations there, That's you know, this yeah. caring, you know, it was very not, about, it was not about surgery. Yes. Yeah. Um, and the tools that he had available at that time were, you know, some of the first transistor hearing aids, such as this picture that we nice. have here. But even at this particular time, the, the use of hearing aids was showing the benefits. Right. Uh, as crude as they were, those people with easy to manage hearing loss, if you fit a hearing aid to, you could approve it. Now, the American um, guidelines, and I mentioned that would provide a link to them yeah. because they're fantastic. They provide, a, they've got a patient guide, they've got a quick executive summary, yeah. and they've also you know, got the evaluation that anybody is, is interested in can actually read. But they're very much like those. You know, obviously, um, Dr. Fowler was using more archaic uh, language and reflected the knowledge at the time, but those were the key points. Right, and right. really, it's the foundation of what we do at the moment. And look, we'll put a copy of those up on the, yeah, on uh, the website after the webinar. So and and there's, access, you know, there's yeah. access to those resources yeah. um, there. Now, I thought I'd actually mention how do hearing aids work, uh, because that is right. the major tool that we have here. Now, here's a picture. Uh, what I want you to imagine is that the, the locust here, the cricket, represents an individual's tinnitus. You know? um, I had a client who swore that cicadas were following him everywhere, wherever he went, and it was only when he was fishing in the middle of the Hauraki Gulf was that he realised, okay, this is actually in my ears. All right. So it's a sound that follows you wherever you go. Now, a person with a hearing loss clearly hears their tinnitus because it's within the processing of the auditory pathways. If they have a hearing loss, the background information here represented by this picture is faded out. Mm -hmm. All right. So when you're looking at this image here, it's, it's trying to represent the background sound environment of an individual. When we fit hearing aids, what we're trying to do I is, is not necessarily to change the tinnitus, but to actually change the environment. So the mm -hmm. contrast suddenly changes. Mm -hmm. Now, it's, it's quite easy to see the tinnitus there, the cricket. It becomes less clear there. And if mm -hmm. we're experiencing this greater stimulation through the auditory environment, a less fuzzy version, then uh, there's more competition with tinnitus and it actually can fall into the background. Relatively if it's, decreasing. Yeah, yeah and if yeah. that is moved into the background, it's easier for our brain to not attend to it. Mm -hmm. If we're not attending to it, we're not focusing on it. One of the great problems with tinnitus is people will tend to listen into it. Yes. And they get better at listening to it. Sort of and so it mm. becomes clearer and so that raises fears itself. Sure. So one of the um, stable tools is, is hearing aids. And for around about 80% of people, they'll put hearing aids in and it will be reduced. Over time, six to 12 months, these tend to result in plastic changes within the auditory system that result in the individual being able to remove their hearing aids and not be as aware of their tinnitus as what it was in the beginning. Oh, that's interesting. So you wouldn't see the hearing aids as a necessarily a, a very long term. No, situation. although the individuals will tend to need them uh, at yeah. the moment for their hearing, but we tend to think of hearing aids not as a prosthetic for tinnitus, but rather as a therapy. So okay. of a, a period of time, yeah, and they can sure. always refer back to those should the tinnitus um, remain a problem. Now the other mainstay, and again, this is this is actually something that um, can be recommended in general practice. Um, people coming in uh, mm -hmm. seeking just some advice on tinnitus, wherever that advice is provided, is the concept of masking. Masking is not a, a new um, concept. Actually, um, Greek philosophers suggested why is it that one sound can drive out another mm. lesser sound and the concept here that you could use masking. In modern terms, it was rediscovered in the 1970s when a physician um, with tinnitus went to the only researcher in the United States at that time undertaking tinnitus research 
Uh, this is a, a photo of a, dear, a deceased friend of mine, Jack Vernon, who was doing animal research. And he said to the physician, I'm not going to be any help to you. I just do research in animals. Don't come and see me. But he came and visited him in Portland, Oregon. And they, after talking for a while, they went for a walk around the water of the, the riverfront in Portland, and it has lots of fountains. And they paused for a moment at the Lovejoy fountain shown here. And uh, Professor Vernon said, let's just go away. You know, it was okay, you know, let's, let's go on to our next thing. And the physician said, I don't want to move. This is the first time I have never heard my tinnitus. And it was the sound of the fountain, the water flowing through, that actually proved a benefit. And still today can go and buy little water fountains, real fountains, put them in their bedroom, and it's beneficial. Really? But, of course, we have electric versions of that. And Jack actually painted the first tinnitus masker. Looks like a hearing aid, yeah. produces a sound. Over time, these have become more and more uh, complicated. Wow. And now um, we can stream all sorts of sounds. So rather than just a hissing sound, we can stream waterfall mm. sounds, rainfall directly right. through uh, to the hearing aids. So the hearing aids mm -hmm. have the hearing aid function, mm -hmm. helping turn up external sounds, providing more normal auditory stimulation of, you know, to a certain extent, mm -hmm. alleviating the hearing problem as well as being able to pipe sound into the environment so that there is more competition. Again, uh, various theories on how these can provide benefit have been extended, uh, what we know at the moment, and also um, the American Academy guidelines suggest hearing aids are recommended, mm -hmm. sound therapy is considered an option. So the recommendation for hearing aids, does that apply to people without demonstrating with, no. loss? No. So in that with... case, at the moment, it's for those individuals with hearing loss. On a pure tone audiometry. On pure tone right. audiometry. So okay. that, that case, it's, it's very clear cut. Yeah. Generally, the recommendation um, would be if people want other stimulation, mm -hmm. they can use whatever thing that so they like. So if you had someone who had apparently normal hearing on testing, you could offer them something like this. They could, they could get they something could choose. Are these expensive? Are they well, expensive? I mean, going through yeah. hearing aid devices like this, yes. this type of thing yeah. is quite expensive. But, of course, you can easily use your smartphone with yeah. headphones. A little bit less convenient. Yeah. And we've done studies Creative. using MP3 players, yeah. um, and people can use them, but the amount of time that they use them is generally less. Right. But... Um, so, so, is that just because they're not? Well, they're fixed, not. Uh, yeah, yeah, it's a little bit less convenient. Yeah. 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 Um, okay. But there are websites, and I'll talk about one shortly, that um, other health professionals can go to provide a, essentially a prescription to your oh, wow. patient. Okay. Say, okay, do you have a phone? Or, you know, yeah. buy a, a smartphone or buy an MP3 player. Go to this website. Yeah. You'll find lots of things that you can then download, counselling mm. material, sounds. Yeah. Okay. So, so when a general practitioner is faced with what is a difficult patient, even for a specialist in the area, and perhaps it's not a bothersome, but you want to do something for this, something. you yeah. don't want to say, well, I can't do anything. Mm. Here is a way of offering, providing a link through to clear advice, Yep. safe advice plus also treatment plan and there's a few different websites oh, i'm going to talk safe. about one oh, you know, be great. Okay. Um, just to show you to provide some evidence for the effects of sound two different groups one group receiving hearing aids that streamed nature sounds to them over a six month period and what we see in a quality of life uh, measure related to tinnitus is essentially a gradual increase the second group uh, received a white noise and what we tend to see and this has been shown in other uh, studies they tend to get a benefit it's fairly quick it's involved in reducing the clarity of tinnitus but maybe that's the extent of the benefit mm. whereas a nature sound also has the benefit perhaps of uh, relaxation sure. positive visualization and so there are other higher level psychosocial effects that 
that can actually have a benefit from. Mm -hmm. It's difficult for us at the moment to say any sound is better than any other. Yeah. Sound mm -hmm. is good. Quiet is bad. Um, even though, quite ironically, that's what people want, yes. is silence. Yeah. yeah. So um, now I've alluded to, to some of the things involved in medical management, and it's quite likely that I've, I've skipped over some things, and many of the questions coming through may be more specific mm -hmm. to this. But, but thinking from what I think a non-medical from a non-medical perspective, a non-prescribing yes. perspective, what um, people at the coalface seeing people with tinnitus um, might want to consider. And I think it would be actually very interesting to really understand in New Zealand what the situation is, the sort of advice mm. that actually is offered at the, mm. at the coalface. We have a bit of an idea from the UK with referrals through to, to the national health system. Mm -hmm. Uh, not so here. But what we do know, reassuring positive counselling, avoiding negative counselling, um, information, um, whether it's written information, telling an individual about what tinnitus is and what it isn't, mm -hmm. reassurance that it is not a sign of medical, of uh, a uh, mental health disorder, that it's quite different from auditory hallucinations when there is a psychosis attached, all right? Um, there's an interesting thing whereby people also hear musical hallucinations. Musical hallucinations are more like tinnitus. They don't ever really have um, any um, psychotic aspect right. to it. Okay. Um, generally, it could be considered a really well-formed form of tinnitus right. and okay. that it has a bit of a tune to it and it has a strong memory association. Mm -hmm. So okay. typically, and it's, you know, why this is, we don't know, it tends to affect older females. Mm -hmm. the, set, the music tends to be from childhood oh, okay. and, and it tends and to loop. And they recognise it, they know but it. They know it and it tends to loop and they don't tend Real, to be bothered by it. Okay. Except yeah. from the fact that it's but you know yeah, is it yeah. something I should be worried about? Yeah. Um, so safe information. I'm going to talk a little bit about tinnitus tunes here. I allude to in a moment. Ear health, considering obviously what I mentioned with regards to pulsatile tinnitus, yeah. vascular problems. Uh, a red flag also is single-sided tinnitus with single-sided hearing loss. Mm -hmm. The concern there is that it might be a retrochoclear lesion, okay. and so referral for audiology, yeah, and the then yeah. referral to otolaryngology is necessary. Depression and anxiety. Now, um, often if we see those in the audiology clinic, we're referring for cognitive behavioral therapy. Because yeah. from an audiology perspective, to actually manage the tinnitus itself, we um, need to have an individual in a state that they are ready to actually tackle that particular problem. And so if this is seen as a comorbidity that actually might be driving the tinnitus, it may be best managed here. Mm -hmm. And so the molecules on the side here are serotonin reuptake right. inhibitors. This might be paroxetine or fluoxetine, I can't, I can't remember. Um, and there was some hope that there would be a strong benefit from SSRIs. Mm -hmm. The evidence on tinnitus is not strong. Okay. But certainly if they're managing anxiety and depression, there's a flow on effect and that can help it. Okay. Um, what's interestingly um, done, uh, we've done some research on MDMA mm -hmm. ecstasy, yep. um, which essentially was designed as a antidepressant mm -hmm. um, and there's some very interesting effects around that um, where individuals, and I must state individuals, will notice that the tinnitus completely goes after a single dose. Wow. Um, the MRI scans are very interesting as well. Um, we certainly are not at a point where we're suggesting um, MDMA therapy in the same way that uh, medicinal cannabis is yeah. becoming a topic, but it's an interesting thing. Mm. Um, managing jaw or neck problems, hyperacusis, 
which is sensitivity to sound and I've got a yeah. case that we'll talk about there referrals is appropriate I wonder if this might be a good time to just address some yeah. of the questions about treatments absolutely in particular I think um, just a couple of people asking you know is unilateral um, tinnitus a red flag and it sounds like you would consider that would be yeah and you know it's it's, it's, a, it's a red flag but most often it's not going to arise into anything significant yeah. because there's a number of things that can cause a unilateral hearing loss but it's one of those things that we just Certainly like to rule out and when we talk about that. it yeah. with an individual um, we don't really because they tend to be anxious already we don't say we're going to need to do a scan to identify whether you have a brain tumor yeah. we're talking about we just want to rule out any medically identifiable cause so that can be managed and then we can move on to the next yeah. thing if need be so at, at a GP level, we would be thinking referring that to audiology first. Yep, and, and then we can see, you know, and we can identify whether we have some concerns there, uh, and if appropriate, we'll refer back with the recommendation for referral, referral. through to an otolaryngologist. And would the same sort of process apply with the pulsatile tinnitus? Yes. Yeah, so first step would be audiology to further investigate. That. Um, well, would I, you potentially I, I would potentially to... consider actually referring yeah. to an otologist in the first oh, yeah. case yeah. Um, there because often the hearing is normal and typically we tell audiologists and, and because audiologists are not really trained in management of vascular of concerns vascular sure. that it's often best to to refer back and yeah. and yeah. a noted laryngologist will if concerned have a hearing test yeah. done at that particular yeah. time as well there was a question early on and i apologize um to the person who asked it for not getting to it until now just talking about um, occupational health obviously with hearing loss and presentations with tinnitus yes um, within the occupational setting and what your advice would be to people presenting that way yeah would that be a similar type of that's an pathway? interesting yeah it's it's a very important thing um, tinnitus may be an early warning to rate a hearing loss right. uh, you know typically when we do see people with tinnitus and hearing loss the hearing loss is in an early stage right. um, and interestingly, not all deaf people, deaf signing people, yeah. actually complain of tinnitus, which you, you would think be might be the case because the injury yeah. is, is the greatest, if you like. Yeah. Um, certainly, we know that, um, uh, for example, nightclub tinnitus, which is the sort of tinnitus you go when you party hard for an evening and you have it and you wake up the next morning, it's there, but then it disappears should be considered as a bit of a warning that if you keep on doing that, mm -hmm. the tinnitus may become there it may not go away and it day. may be associated with a hearing loss. Okay. Uh, it's not a particularly good screening for hearing loss to be asking whether you have tinnitus, but certainly the presence of tinnitus should be a warning to individuals sure. to take appropriate protection. And uh, this is actually an important thing related to hyperacusis. Mm -hmm. Some people that are given the message to be careful about their hearing go overboard and they start to protect their hearing more and more. Now, anybody that's worn earmuffs for a protracted period of time will notice when they take them off, everything seems a little bit louder, right? Mm -hmm. If you wear hearing protection continuously, you effectively train the brain Right. that that's your new that's normal new volume, I see. and then people go into an everyday environment and they cannot cope without the hearing protection right and that's right. hyperacusis yeah. so an, an unusual sensitivity to loud sound yeah. we will see people sitting in our quite quiet waiting room which has very little noise apart from magazines flipping yeah. wearing earmuffs wow when we take them into the room and have a conversation, we you know assure them about the levels of sound. They take the earmuffs on, they've got earplugs on underneath. Gosh. Okay. And that can be created by those individuals. Yeah. yeah. That makes sense. Now let me just scan through here. I think there was a question too, um, talking about oh, and let me let me clarify too for the person who asked about the use of the term red flags. Yep. You're absolutely correct. We do usually mean that in a red flag setting in GP practice we talk about what are life-threatening um, conditions 
in this case, we're sort of using this more colloquially in the sense of what needs investigation. Yes, yes, sorry, that, that's so sort of from an audiology. A warning, a warning yeah, sign. from from a, from an audiology <laughs> perspective, there yeah. are, there are seldom um, life threatening yep. uh, situations. But and we would need to investigate. Yeah, and in fact, a, probably the only situation where a, 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 a case from you know um, an, a, a health emergency that, yep. that's unrelated to hearing. The only situations that really we end up with life-threatening consequences are when we get an individual threatening self-harm, possibly from their tinnitus. Right. Um, and again, if, if this is the case, yeah. um, individuals are um, recommended that they contact the crisis team within their yeah. um, district health boards Follow and things like that. Pathway for that. Yeah. Extremely rare, but it, it can happen. I wonder if um, you would have any um, comment? There was a we were talking before about blood tests and just checking mm. for thyroid. Is there any known link between hypo or hypothyroidism uh, and tinnitus? Or there, is there's just more of a general there, there's screening. A general like health line? screening, but okay. there there may okay. be some suggestions there. Um, okay. But it's generally around main, making sure that there are no the person's health is good, and this came also to lifestyle factors. Okay and diet, it's generally about making sure that these sorts of things are as okay, good as so possible. Sort of a bit of a judgment about the, how much we need to investigate other conditions if absolutely. we know the yeah. patient. You're certainly yeah. undertaking blood tests yeah. purely because a person had tinnitus is probably it's, not the case. Yeah. It's, uh, if there are yeah. other things there that may be related to the sure. tinnitus. Yeah, no, that makes sense. I think um, someone's just suggested um, whether you can suggest any options for someone with tinnitus with who has a cochlear implant, um, in yeah. this case, post meningitis. Is that a well, situation a, that you can? Uh, yeah, so usually cochlear implants will actually assist tinnitus. Right. And so a cochlear implant provided surgically, typically when the hearing loss is too great to benefit from hearing aids. Mm -hmm. In this case, we believe that the cochlear implant is having the same benefits as providing a hearing aid is. It's that situation with the background. Suddenly, so bring yep. the electrical stimulation itself. It may be something to do with that. Certainly, there are individuals who have uh, hearing loss, perhaps from meningitis, mm. have tinnitus, and the cochlear implant doesn't do anything. There'll be some cases where a person does not have tinnitus prior to a cochlear implant and will develop tinnitus mm. because of the trauma associated with the surgical uh, situation. Mm -hmm. It's uh, relatively rare that the cochlear implant won't have benefit, uh, and there's a lot of work looking at trying to improve the programming of that device mm -hmm. to provide stimulation that will be of more benefit. Okay. Um, but often it's, it's quite a clear that worked, mm -hmm. didn't have any effect. Yeah. Uh, and without knowing the specific uh, case details, um, it does not mean that the tinnitus will remain there uh, and there are things that can be done and it's certainly worth a patient with tinnitus and a cochlear implant to talk about to that with your audiologist right. because there okay. may be some new strategies yeah. that can actually be applied. Oh, that's great. I'm just noticing the time. We'd better move on to these cases before yes. we uh, run out of time. I think we're already over the hour, but we'll, okay. we'll so go we through a little to, bit. Okay, so we need to we can march on. Click on here. Oh, sorry. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Uh, I wanted to men mention tinnitus tunes. Um, a, a little bit of a, a declaration of conflict of interest in that um, I'm involved in tinnitus tunes. This is a spin out of the university, so um, just make that buyer aware. Thank you. Um, there are a number of websites on, on, that are safe. Uh, typically those of the American Tinnitus Association mm -hmm. and the British Tinnitus Association. They provide good um, information to people, but they are not really treatment focused. Tinnitus Tunes was actually developed to try and make our research, our clinical materials available 24-7 oh, okay. and available particularly not only uh, to individuals searching the web themselves, but to uh, general practice and other health care professionals who are dealing often with those individuals curious about tinnitus, maybe a bit of a problem, but 
who really don't want to go to see audiology or see a specialist. Yep. So here is a website that people can go on to. It's subscription based. It contains uh, brain training, counselling information, uh, sounds that can be downloaded to um, onto MP3 players and so on for tinnitus treatment. It also sends. Um, it's got blogs and updates people with the latest information. So I don't want to dwell on that, but that certainly is a, a resource that we think will be valuable to people out there in the community. Um, for example, um, there's a group of professionals called hearing therapists who are out in the regional towns mm -hmm. providing uh, information. And this is one of the resources that they use quite widely. Oh, that's great. Um, I just acknowledge my various yeah. funding agencies and you know yeah. thank you to the sponsors thank you sponsors <laughs> um, before looking at some of these cases yeah. uh, now this is a tinnitus curious case all right quite frequent um, they appeared in the clinic and all these cases are those that are coming into audiology here at the university they pretty atypical of what we believe people in general practice are also seeing and are uh, uh, visiting pharmacists and mm -hmm. so on so it's had tinnitus for a long period of time, but the complaints are want to hear what people are saying at functions, mm -hmm. want to hear what people are saying when it's quiet, wants to hear the high frequency better, loves listening to music, but they can't do that because of their tinnitus. So mm -hmm. all the complaints come actually back to tinnitus. Um, but um, is what's quite clear in yeah. the clinic, and once we do hearing tests, is it's actually the hearing that is the underlying problem. Mm. But ha however, you hear tinnitus, you cannot hear a hearing loss. So it's a, a quite common for people to blame their tinnitus yeah, sure. for all the hearing related problems. Mm. And so it's actually quite easy to manage tinnitus in this case, mm. because their complaints, their goals for treatment are all about Related to, to hearing. hearing. Yeah. And so providing some counselling about mm. that, that you are hearing tinnitus, but in fact, it may not be, that, that may, may not, not be your problem. Yeah. And um, mm. so what we typically will do is we will provide counselling around the role of a fear and attention. Typically, these individuals will not have clinically significant depression or anxiety. Mm. If they were to have that, we would consider uh, where that management best lie. Is it relatively low level? Can it be managed by uh, counselling? Mm -hmm. Or does it need to be a referral to a psychologist for cognitive behavioural therapy? Mm -hmm. uh, for a note, for those people referring out there, there are not a lot of psychologists that see tinnitus as their area of speciality. Um, we face the same problem in our referrals, finding a psychologist in the area. What I would suggest is, Find out if there is a psychologist that you know who manages chronic pain and suggest to them that all they really need to do is substitute tinnitus in for the language that they use right. for chronic so pain. So okay. there are lots of similarities mm -hmm. there in the relationship and the complaints. Sure. Mm -hmm. um, so, so in this case, management of hearing is, is the issue, all right, and, and managing that. So that's a tinnitus curious case, but it really relates to hearing. Then at the other end of the scale, we have catastrophic tinnitus. Uh, this was a male um, involved in the sound recording industry. Okay, um, For us, our worst nightmare is anybody that, whose profession involves listening the to sound. <laughs> uh, musicians, yeah. sound engineers, um, because they know how to listen and boy, can they listen to their tinnitus, mm. and boy, does it has an impact on their life. Yeah, so yeah. naturally, they're concerned about their profession and so on. They tend to be very anxious about it. In this partic uh, particular case, the person did express uh, suicidal thoughts. Gosh. Um, we talked through this. They were under psychological management, and they have been in a a back and forth management. We've we've essentially here acted as the case management mm -hmm. and there are often cases where the, the general practitioner may be best suited to act, act yeah. as the case manager but with a number of spokes going out 
um, and it may be uh, physical therapy, it may be um, psychology, it may be hearing. Um, and there are different ways of obviously running this, but that's one thing. Um, we did refer them for um, massage therapy on their, their jaw and neck pain. That helped. It's possibly the thing that helped them the most. Mm -hmm. Again, why mm -hmm. is this? Possibly between the link between activation of the neck muscles, underlying um, neurons, the connection with the auditory system, possibly related to our head movement for localization. There was a question on that earlier that, again, apologise we didn't get to earlier, um, any involvement also of the eye? So yes, no, I, I did, I mentioned, yep. of course, in the Sorry case of the, the imaging study, the strange yeah, thing, why, why, why is that? Now, again, could be related to movement in mm -hmm. vestibular or what? Audition, we, we tend to think about hearing as a survival sense. In that, what I mean is that it's always active and it can hear around corners, right? And that's really quite powerful um, and it's alert. It's always active. But what we do generally when we hear a sound, particularly one that we find threatening, is that we use our visual system to confirm it. Right. And then we interact with it, our somatosensory system. Tinnitus is the only sound that does not have a physical object causing it. Right. So in mm -hmm. fact, there's a disassociation between vision and hearing. People that hear tinnitus go looking for it. Yeah. When they can't find it, that's often the trigger for it to become a problem. Yeah. It's very unusual, unnatural yeah. for you to hear something that you cannot that see. You can't. Like so that, that's why where's where the, yeah, the visual system can come in. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and that's one of the drivers for tinnitus becoming a problem when people can't identify what it is causing mm. it. Mm. Um, and, you know, tinnitus was ruining his life and, and really had great difficulty accepting the reassurance. So it was not responsive to our counselling. Yeah. Uh, so hearing was normal. We right. provided sound therapy, yeah. uh, had a very high-pitched tinnitus. Uh, interestingly, tinnitus does not tend to be particularly loud. Right. When we match it to an external sound, it is matched to a quiet sound. Right. But the brain has an unusual perception of it that turns it from something that should be, at face value, quite um, innocuous yes. into something quite major. Uh, we referred to a psychologist, um, reluctant, yeah. um, very, uh, and the psychologist had mentioned the fact that the, the message really wasn't getting through. Yeah. Same counselling every you know session because it just wasn't coming. Very unwilling to use medications. Yeah. We find this quite often um, more in the non-bothersome tinnitus or mildly of a problem. Mm -hmm. People are not particularly keen on loading medications. Uh, sound therapy, these were hearing aid style devices, provided some benefit, was using them regularly, um, got re um, support through the Tinnitus Tunes website. Uh, probably one of the most important things there was the 24-7 thing because sure. they could go online and get the positive messages. This person was yeah. someone that was continually email or phoning the right. clinic for that yeah. sort of advice yeah. and we could um, manage that. Um, yeah. frequently six uh, second opinions. This individual was actually having almost weekly hearing tests oh for, 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 really for wanting, you know, and if we could mm. take a, a brain image and find the thing that was causing tinnitus, mm. that might help, help them, mm. but we can't. Uh, and, you know, in the end, we would, you know, we we had to say, look, we're not doing another hearing test because it's not really going to change things. Mm -hmm. So the person would go to another That's audiologist. Yeah. And, and unfortunately, um, we get this ongoing spiralling uh, situation. So so this, this would be the sort of scenario, anxious, difficult to um, participate in counselling, resistant to many things that would see us seeing this individual repeatedly over many years. And it's about trying to 
chip away in many ways. Um, and there are clients that we have seen very much like this who we have been successful with. Sure. So uh, but it does, with the... Yep, the positive messages, trying to discourage from trying every possible treatment out mm. there, because if they do, it's likely that they will have multiple failures and then their, their hopes are raised. Mm. And then they um, unfortunately mm. have those dashed. And, and the final case here, if we've still got time. Yeah, just a couple of minutes. Okay. We need to wrap it up. But yep. yeah, no, um, hyperacusis, sound yeah. sensitivity. Yeah. Um, and this was associated with a traumatic brain injury. Right. So typically with a traumatic brain injury, often one of the last things that is managed after memory, obviously survival, yeah. um, these daily yeah. lifetime, you know, getting on with Activity. daily life, yeah. one yeah. of the last things that often is managed, sometimes many years after the initial injury, is hearing related. Right. Commonly hyperacusis and often a, an intolerant, they just cannot cope in a noisy environment. Confused with fatigue often, mm -hmm. they want to get out of that environment. It's difficult to say whether they are truly annoyed by the sound, whether it's actually discomfort to sound, or they simply can't cope. They're overwhelmed with just sure. all the information. Yeah. So this person was wearing earplugs. Our first thing to do is to identify mm -hmm. when they can wear those safely. So those situations that are dangerous, noise-inducing mm. situations, all right, where people should normally wear them. Weaning them off normal earplugs into what we call uh, non-linear earplugs. And these allow quiet sounds through, but cut out loud sounds. Okay. Uh, they're often used for, shout, um, for shooting. Person had mild hearing loss. While the worst fear that they had is more sound, we actually had to work on that concept. Sure. And so very much mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a weaning from hearing protection onto some sound stimulation onto normal perception of sound. Mm. This process with a hyperacusis individual will take many, many months. Yeah, I can imagine. And for those that know working with brain injured um, persons. That's a very long process um, and frustrating for the individual. Mm -hmm. However, quite typically when we see them, when we're managing this, they have gone through the hard road right. and they almost understand that they know this and they're willing to put the, the hard yards right. in because mm -hmm. they have had to manage that mm -hmm. with many of the other things that they've, they've gone to. Um, brain training which is um, an attention-based um, process for auditory stimuli uh, is something that we've found really useful for tolerance of background sound. And uh, we've made some of that available uh, through the Tinnitus Tunes website as well. That sounds really well. good. We'll have to have a good look at that website. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and we can provide Thank a link through that. to that. Yeah, we absolutely um, will pop that up. Um, well, look, I think, does that bring us to the end of our... Well, I think that, I think that's really pretty much the really end of my yeah. little little talk there. Yeah, and, you know, as I say, the, these sorts of things tend to go on a little bit and you can talk mm -hmm. for a long well, time. Well, that's very interesting, oh, um, But, you know, for those people that I haven't been able to answer questions for, I yes, apologise. I apologise if we haven't got to your particular question. We'll have a look through and if there's any information we can put up on the website afterwards, we absolutely will. That might, um, yeah, I'm very pleased help. to provide that. And if people um, do have questions about cases or so on, they're welcome to email oh, me. Oh, thank you. That's really and I'm kind. very yeah. happy to send off yeah. emails and help yeah, direct people good. in the right direction. Oh, well, thank you. I think we've, um, I've, I've certainly learned a lot and I think we've had some great feedback from people saying thanks very much. So great. really, that's really thank good you. talk. So thanks everyone for tuning in and hope we see you at the next webinar. And um, Yeah, well, thank you for the opportunity. It's, it's going to be great. Thank okay. you. Okay. Good night, everyone. Good night. <laughs>